pardon me, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. That's uh, Hosea chapter 1, and then 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, and I will not refer to that until the, toward the end of the message. Um, you will hear me say in a minute that Hosea is a special book to me. And several years ago, I wrote this little booklet. I wrote several of them. They're titled uh, uh, Bible Studies for Busy People. And uh, this is on the prophet with a broken heart. And there's some of them in the information room underneath the stairs here. They're normally $10, but we have a special tonight for 20 <laughs> Pick up two or three of them. No, <laughs> no you have to, all you have to do is go back there and get one. And uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it very much if you would like to do that. Now, you know that Brother Park has set a tradition that before he preaches, and I guess before I preach or anybody else, we're supposed to tell a joke. The only problem is I don't have any jokes. But I have a lot of information that Park's sons-in-law keep feeding me. And uh, sometimes, you know, you'll just die laughing. Sometimes you're shaking your head. But one of his son and sons-in-law told me, said, uh, you know, several years ago, Park was pastoring church, and there was a man in the community that called him one day and said, would you meet me in my office today at 11 o'clock? He said, well, I, I guess so. What for? He said, well, there's going to be two other preachers here. So he got him in his office at 11 o'clock and he said, I want you guys to know that I'm tired of hearing you say, I can't take my money with me. So he said, I'm giving each one of you $100,000 and I want you to promise me that when I die, you will be the last three guys that walk by my casket and you'll stick that $100,000 up in there. Well, you know, by the time this guy died, one or two of the preachers had moved off, but Park was still there. And sure enough, when it came time for the funeral, these three guys were the last three that walked by, and they all stuck something up in there with the guy. They get away from the church, and they're standing outside, and uh, one of them says, guys, said, listen, said, he was a Methodist preacher, and he said, we've got a, a, an orphanage that really was strapped for some money, and I took 20000 of that one hundred, and I gave it to them, so I only put $80,000 in there. Well, it wasn't very long that the Assembly of God pastor said, well, I sort of did the same thing. He said, we had some missions, missionaries that really were needing some money. So he said, I took 40000 and I only put 60000 up in there. Well, Brother Park didn't say anything. So they finally said, well, what, what, what about you? And he said, well, I, first of all, I can't believe you guys did that. And they said, well, what did you do? He said, well, I put the $100,000 in my checking account, and I wrote him a check, and I put it up in there with him. <laughs> but now, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story one month later, that, cat, that check went through the bank. <laughs> and Park's still trying to figure out how that guy got that check cashed. But his sons-in-law said what we found out is that a couple of the funeral directors saw it laying there and they took it out and endorsed it for the old fella and they got the money and split it, but we're not telling Park what happened. Take your Bibles and turn to Hosea chapter 1 and stand for the reading of God's Word. Chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Hosea the son of Beri in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, and the land ha for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. Now come over in chapter 2. 
You know the story how that eventually Gomer left for her false lovers. And in chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, Therefore, this was meant for Gomer and for Israel together, actually. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. And then look at chapter 3. Then the Lord said unto me, Go again. Love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who took to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us tonight. And dear Father, we want you to speak to us individually. We don't want to go through this message and see, well, it applies to other people. We want you to speak to us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Now, the book of Hosea has been one of my favorites in the Bible, and there's several reasons that's true. Number one, when I had a seminary pastorate, up at Paris, Texas, Marilyn and I, the services started at 5 o'clock. The services ended about 6. We'd be in the car headed to Fort Worth at 6.30. We'd stop usually at Commerce and get us a hamburger or a hot dog or something like that. And on the way then, we would listen to Wonderful Words of Life. It was the radio program of North Fort Worth Baptist Church, and Dale Lowry was the pastor and the preacher on this program. He would preach for 30 minutes, and he preached a series of messages on Hosea the prophet. And I really got to where I loved Hosea, but I also loved the way that Dr. Lowry preached expository messages. And I thought, when I get to be a pastor, that's the way I hope I can preach. The second reason I like the book is when I became a pastor, I have preached through the book probably two or three times. Another reason I like it is that Hosea and Daniel are very similar. In Daniel, you have 12 chapters, and the first six chapters give us the biography of the life of Daniel. Then the second six chapters give us the prophecies of Daniel. Well, when you come to Hosea, the first three chapters give us the biography of Hosea the prophet. And out of what happened to him and what he experienced came, became, came his message and chapters 4 through 14, 11 chapters, and then deal with the message of Hosea. So Hosea has been one of my favorites. I've titled the message tonight, Lessons from a Broken Old Testament Relationship, Family Relationship, A Broken Home in the Old Testament. And we're going to learn from Hosea, we're going to learn from Gomer, and then we're going to learn from what God told Hosea to do with the situation. First of all, Hosea himself. Look at your Bible. It says in verse 2, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry, departing from the Lord. Now, there are many that believe that God told Hosea to go and find a prostitute named Gomer and marry her. I don't think that's what happened myself. I think Brother Sam takes that position. But I look at it a little differently. I believe she was a virgin. I believe she was a pure young woman. And Hosea went and married Gomer as God had directed him, but God knew that she was going to become a prostitute. Hosea didn't really realize that. Well, the first three or four, five, six, up to seven or eight years of their marriage went really well. Look at verse 3. So he, that is Hosea, went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, 
For in a little while I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Now the name Jezreel means bloodshed. And what God is actually saying here is I'm going to bring bloodshed upon the nation of Israel. Well, a little later on in chapter 6, now you've got to stop and realize that, you know, this baby has been weaned and back in that day and time. That usually took at least two years. But then they have a second baby, a little girl. And Gomer conceived again and bore a daughter. Then God said unto Hosea, Call her name Lo-Ruhema, for I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Now, the name Lo-Ruhema means no mercy. And God says very plainly here, for I will no longer have mercy upon the house of Israel. And then down in verse 8, a third child comes along. They have a son, they have a daughter, they're going to have another son. Now, when she had weaned Lo-Ruhema, she conceived and bore a son. Then God said, call his name Lo-Ami or Lo-Ami. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. The name Lo Am I means not my people. So you have these three children, and God has asked Hosea to name them because he wants them to be an object lesson to the nation of Israel. Now, I believe it's after these two, three children are born that Gomer leaves Hosea and starts living with false lovers and she even eventually probably became a prostitute and, and was uh, down in the gutters of life. I believe what happened with Hosea was something like this. One night he was coming home from doing whatever a prophet did back in that day and time. And he'd stopped and picked up three or four cakes of bread. And he was headed home. And as he got close to their house, he heard a child crying. And he thought, that's funny. Then the closer he got, he says, that sounds like my little girl. Then he got even closer and he said, well, my little girl and my baby boy are both crying. And he turns the corner and there they are sitting in the doorway and the older brother is trying to cons console them without any success. And Hosea runs up to them and he looks at the oldest son and he says, Jezreel, what, what's going on? What's happening? Why are your brother and sister crying? And he said, Daddy, he said, uh, Mother's not here. He said, What do you mean, Mother's not here? He said, Daddy, she left earlier today in the daytime with another man. And Hosea's heart just sinks. And he said, Daddy, when she was leaving with that man, they were kissing each other. Why were they doing that? And Hosea's heart just broke. He went ahead that night and got the children fed and got them in bed, and then he started pacing the floor back and forth, back and forth. When something like that happens to you, what's the question you ask? Why? Or maybe what and why? What's going on? Why? God, why is this happening? And he doesn't really get any answers. I personally believe that probably went on for two or three nights, maybe a week or two, I don't know. But he kept saying, God, what, what do you want me to learn? What's happening here? Why is this happening? And all of a sudden, a still small voice comes to Hosea and said, Hosea, you really loved Gomer, didn't you? Oh, yes, Lord, I loved her so much. He said, Hosea, I love Israel just like you love Gomer. And, it's, you know, it's not a voice from heaven. It's not a verbal voice, but it's just a still, small voice in here. And he keeps going, and, and, and maybe later that night or maybe the next night, he's again saying, God, why? What's going on? And he said, Hosea, you didn't deserve what Gomer did, did you? No, I, me and my children, we haven't deserved this. And he said, Hosea, neither have I deserved the spiritual immorality of my people. 
who have left me for false lovers instead of worshiping the one who is the true husband of their souls. And this just keeps going on. And, 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 and eventually Hosea gets this picture that what is happening to him and to his children is a picture of what is happening to God in the ten northern tribes of Israel. You see, they had ran away from God. They were not worshiping God. They were worshiping false gods. God kept trying to bring them back to himself. They would not listen. And they had actually literally, well, they had committed literal adultery because they went to prostitutes and many times they were in the temple area. But they also committed spiritual adultery because they had left the true lover of their souls. You see, God had come to them to Israel and had adopted Israel as a young maiden and brought her to himself and betrothed her to himself. And then he married her and became her husband and he had loved her. He loved her with every ounce of love that he could love. But yet she had turned her back on him and was sinning against him. And God is using this thing with Hosea as an object lesson to get Hosea to realize how much he is hurt because of the sin of Israel. Now, this story of Hosea and Gomer certainly applies to Israel. We'll see that throughout these passages. But I think it applies to us today also. Now, we as a nation are not a covenant nation like Israel was. But yet we are a nation that God has blessed richly Amen? And yet, as a nation, we keep turning our back upon God and going after the false gods of our world. Education, technology, success, you name it. Government, on and on we could go. And therefore, as a nation, we've turned our back upon God. But that doesn't concern me as much as the fact that this applies to us as Christians. God has blessed us so much. But just as Gomer had hurt Hosea and just as Israel had hurt God, I believe that born-again Christians in the United States of America have been hurting God because we've refused to live for him the way he wants us to live for him. Amen? I have to examine myself at that point. He's given us so much. How have I returned my gratitude to him by the way I've lived for him? So I think what Hosea experienced applies to you and to me also. We have to be careful. It's real easy to say, well, you know, those liberals, yeah, they've turned their back upon God for sure. But what about us? We need to be careful there. Sometimes we do that. Amen? Amen. The second person you can learn from Hosea in this broken relationship, the second person that you can learn from is Gomer herself. Look at chapter 2. Now when you come to chapter 2, chapter 2 applies to Gomer personally, but it also applies to Israel whom Gomer represents. And the 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 passages in here are all intertwined and mixed up because one minute, one phrase will refer to Gomer as Hosea's wife. The next phrase will refer primarily to Israel. Sometimes you can't tell which one the phrase is referring to. Sometimes it refers possibly to both of them. Look at verse, chapter 2, verse 2. Bring charges against your mother. Bring charges for she is not my wife. For I am, nor am I her husband. Now, I think at that point, Hosea is speaking and he's talking to his children in a figurative way and, and he's talking about Gomer. But let's keep going. Let her put away her harlotries from her side and her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like dry land, and slay her with thirst. Now, somewhere in there, 
God is talking about Israel, not about Gomer. Gomer represents Israel. Come down in verse 5. Halfway through that verse it says, For she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. Look down at verse 8. For she did not know that I gave her grain, new wine and oil, and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. Come down to verse 12. And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees of which she has said, these are my wages. Now those first three lines I'm pretty sure refer to Israel. But in, in, when it starts with these are my wages that my lovers have given me, so I will make them a forest and the beast of the field shall eat them. God's still speaking. I will punish her for the days of Baals to which she burned incense. She decked herself, this may be referring back to Gomer, she decked herself with her earrings and jewelry and went after her lovers, but me she forgot, says the Lord. Now can you imagine Hosea? He didn't have a lot of money, but he had some means. And every now and then he'd buy Gomer a new dress. She'd save it for special occasions. Along the way, he bought her some pieces of jewelry, not anything lavish, not anything she would wear every day, but just on special occasions. But then when she leaves home and starts living with her lovers, all of a sudden, Hosea finds out that she's telling her false lovers and her false friends, my lovers have given these things to me. Can you imagine the hurt on Hosea? My, you know, my lovers have given this to you. I mean, you. Can you imagine now she's been with one lover named Hank and another one named Henry, and she's now with Henry, and she puts that special dress on, and she says, Henry, Hank gave this dress to me. Now, she tells him that, hoping that he'll get jealous and what? Go and buy her another dress. And this went on with, with Gomer, I'm convinced. But you see, it pictures what Israel had done. Israel had taken all of the bounty that God had lavished upon her. Her crops, her cattle, her blessings, her borders had been expanded. And, and God had just really blessed her in many, many ways. In fact, Israel went through a period about this time of pretty good prosperity. But instead of saying, oh, God gave this to us. Our Lord Jehovah has given all of this to us. What did they do? They started saying, our false gods have given this to us. Baal has given this to us. And instead of attributing it to God, they gave it credit to the false gods of Israel. But you know what? I'm so afraid that in America we're doing the same thing again. All of the blessings that God has given unto us we have said, well, we've gotten these blessings because of our education, because of our technology. We've gotten these blessings because we're just a special people. And, and we don't take the time as a nation to say we have these blessings because God has given them to us. But then we need to be careful as individuals also. By the way, we could apply this to a church. We have been so blessed. We are so blessed. But we can start saying, well, we built this building. We're having high attendance. We're doing this. We're supporting uh, 25, 26 missions. But what we should be saying is God is doing this. God has blessed us with these facilities. God has blessed us with our good attendance. God has blessed us by giving us the abilities to support these missions in his name. So therefore, we need to be giving credit to God. Amen? Now, again, as individual believers, sometimes we have to be careful. We'll do this. You know, well, boy, I saved for this, and I saved for that, and I worked real hard for that, and I earned every bit of it. Do you remember the movie... Uh, 
Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart. I, I'm dating myself. But Jimmy Stewart was, the setting is during the war, uh, Civil War, and Jimmy Stewart's ranch and facilities and his farm is located really on the border between the North and the South. He has a son that fights for the North. He has a son that fights for the South. And they go through some pretty tough times because the two armies keep coming through his property and they devastate it. I read a story one time about a woman in Tennessee who was really, really bitter at the Yankees because she'd had this beautiful oak tree in her yard and it had been shelled so many different times that it just, there was nothing there. And uh, Robert E. Lee came to visit her one day and she was telling him about how bitter she was about that tree and what the Yankees did to it. When Lee got ready to leave, he turned around and looked at her. He said, Martha, cut that old tree down and forget about it. Go on with your life. Well, you see, we tend to take our blessings and we become bitter if they don't turn out the way we want them to. But we need to remember that everything that we have is a gift from God. Amen? Now, I want to show you some more about Gomer. Look at verses, uh, look at verse uh, 5. No, I'm sorry, verse 6. God says, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up your way with thorns and wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them but not find them. God said, Gomer, I'm going to hedge you up. Now, what in the world was a hedge? In that day and time, the farmers and ranchers didn't have a or even if they, well, if they had crops and they wanted to keep animals out, they couldn't have, you know, they didn't have barbed wire, they didn't have chain link fences. So what they would do is plant these hedge bushes. Usually they were thorn bushes, and they were as thick as you can imagine, you know. And sometimes they'd put a raised beam, a raised levy, I guess you'd say, two or three feet tall around their property. They'd plant these bushes on it and the, the limbs would fall down on the ground and it was just nearly Im impossible for anything to get through those hedges. And God says to Gomer, I'm going to hedge you in. Now he didn't mean literal hedges like that, but he meant, Gomer, I'm going to use your circumstances to get you hedged in. And I picture it like this with Gomer. She's walking with this lover one day, and all of a sudden he leaves her, and she says to the people, where did he go? And they said, he went back home to his wife and children. Oh, okay. So she goes that direction, and she gets down there and finds out the lover she's looking for is not there, and she asks somebody, where is he? And they said, oh, he's with another woman now, not you. And again, she comes back and she goes this direction, same thing happens. She goes that direction, same thing happened. And she's hedged in. And then she starts going back to the different locations. And I believe that what God did was that he took those circumstances and used them to just box her in a little tighter every day, every week. Notice what it says in chapter 2 and verse 7. Then she will say, in the middle of that verse, I will go and return to my first husband. The first one who loved me, in other words. For then it was better for me than now. You know what that moment is right there? That's a prodigal son moment. You remember the prodigal son said, it says in chapter 15 and verse 17 of Luke's gospel that when he came to himself, he said, man, why am I here with, with these pigs? My father's servants have it better than I have it. I will get up and go home and tell my father I don't deserve to be your son. Just make me one of your servants. Well, Gomer is having a prodigal son moment. But I want to tell you something. Now, we're going to see in a minute that just as she gets to this point, God sends Hosea out looking for her, I believe. I believe they're pretty close together. God tried his best to hedge Israel in. 
He tried everything. He brought calamity upon her time after time, trying to get her to turn to him, return to him. And you see what happens here in Hosea and Gomer's story is that the hedges work with Gomer. She eventually gets back with Hosea because God tells him to go out and find her and love her. And, and they, they are reconciled. There's redemption in their relationship. But it never worked with Israel. God tried and he tried and he tried and eventually his message through Hosea was you need to tell the ten northern tribes that if they don't repent and turn to me, I'm going to destroy them. And boy, did he do that. Today we refer to the ten lost tribes of Israel. They're scattered. We have no idea where they all are. Now there's been some preachers that have tried to make Britain and the English-speaking Western world, Britain and the United States, as being the ten lost tribes that God restored. That's, that's not biblical. There's, there's nothing in that. And God destroyed them, and then he moved down and started trying to work with Judah and Benjamin, the southern two tribes. But listen, I used to say, if we don't repent as a nation, God is going to judge us. I've quit saying that because I believe with all of my heart God is already judging us. I believe God is hedging us in as a people, trying to get us to wake up and return to him. But you see, God can also do that with churches. He can do that with individuals. You know, you're living away from God. And God can head you in in ways you can't imagine. You leave your mate for another lover and your kids stop speaking to you. I've seen it happen more than once. You start neglecting worship and service of God and he can use, I used to say 101, then I went to 1,001. He has limited way, limitless ways that he can use to head you in and get you to try, try to get you to come back to him. It might be the loss of a job. It might be a demotion on your job that you have. It might be missing out on a promotion that you're just sure that you were going to get. You were more qualified than anybody else, but you were passed over and someone else got the promotion. It might be the betrayal of a friend. It might be sickness, bad health, it, either for you or for your loved ones around you. It might be a traffic accident that causes you the loss of a vehicle. It might be that your house burns. It might be that your house just starts falling apart. And it just seems like you can't keep up with all the repairs that need to be done. It might be that your pet dog bites your neighbor. <laughs> uh, some of you chuckled. You have a pet dog. Boy, we've got one. He is a pure thoroughbred mutt. His name is Rufus. And uh, when I used to walk him every morning, I had him on a leash, of course. We could come to Great Danes. We could come to German Shepherds. And he felt like it was his calling to run those dogs out of the neighborhood. But then he'd dig out from under our fence and go down to their backyard and play with them. And the reason he did that when he was on a leash, I believe, was because he thought he had to protect me. But you may have something happen to you that you can't imagine that God brings to try to head you in and get you to realize that he wants you to return to him. He can do it. Be careful. God may be building hedges to box you in even right now until he gets your undivided attention. The third truth that we learn is from, goes back sort of to Hosea, but it more involves what God tells Hosea. Look at chapter 3. Then the Lord said unto me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover. Now I take that to mean that she was living with one of her false lovers. 
and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel, you love her just like the Lord has the love that he has for Israel, who took to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I, Hosea speaking, first person, I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. Now let's just look at that figure. It, it's really, if you figure out the barley, I think it was about eight or nine bushels, and, and they say that probably the total value of all of this with the silver and the barley was about 30 shekels of silver. That didn't mean that it was an exorbitant price, but it meant that it was a price that Hosea had to really probably get the money together to go and buy her. It may have been a cheap price, cheaper than it normally would have been because she had lowered herself to such low standards that she would just move in and live with anybody. And I said unto her, You shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. She was going to have to go through a period of purification. I believe this period lasted at least several weeks, maybe several months. And then she said, he, he says in verse 4, For the children of Israel shall abide many days. Do you see how you, he, Hosea is already taking this and applying it to Israel? For the children of Israel shall abide many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or teraphim, pillar without ephod, or a, a sacred pillar, pardon me, and uh, without ephod or a teraphim. And after the children of Israel, afterwards the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now listen, there's four characteristics of um, Hosea's love. Number one, it was planned and intentional. You see, Hosea just didn't wander through the market one day and bumped into Gomer, and they got to talking, and he said, you know, the kids would really like to see you. Won't you come by the house for a little while? Uh-uh. God told him, you make plans. You go. He had to have the resources already with him to buy her back when he found her. He went looking for her. I'm not for sure he found her right away. I think he probably had to look for days, maybe a week or two. I don't know. But his going after her was planned. It was intentional. The second thing that you can see about his love was that his love that he extended to Gomer was undeserved. She didn't deserve it. Amen? Are y'all awake? She did not deserve it. The third thing that you see is that it cost a price. It had to be secured with a cost. And then the fourth thing you see is that it was redemptive. And what I mean by that is that God brought Gomer back to Hosea and there was a restored relationship between Hosea and Gomer just like it had been before she had left. <coughs> she again was his wife. She again loved him. He loved her, and they lived together in a loving relationship as a husband and wife. I believe her restoration was not just with Hosea, but also with her children. She came back, and she became Hosea's wife, but she also became the children's mother, and she loved them, and she cared for them the best she could. And by the way, as far as we know, that was the way it was the rest of Hosea and Gomer's life. But you see, this applies to Israel, and it also applies to us today. It applied to Israel. God says, I love Israel. Jose, I love her as much as you ever thought about loving Gomer. And, and, and the love that God had for Israel was planned and intentional. He purposely <coughs> sought to love her and love her and bring her back into a right relationship with himself. It was also Israel did not deserve God's love. Thirdly, it cost a price. God had to keep on keeping on doing things 
He sent his prophets repeatedly to say to her, Repent and return unto me. And they would not listen. And then it was to be redemptive. God wanted to bring Israel back to him and have a relationship with her that he had wanted from the very beginning. But you know the sad story about Israel? Like I said, Gomer and Hosea's relationship was restored. It was redemptive. And God wanted it to be redemptive with Israel, but it never happened. Israel never returned to her. Did you know that God has loved us the same way? God has loved you and me in a way that was planned and intentional. The death of Christ on the cross was not just an accident that happened in history. God purposed that event. He had planned it even before the foundations of the world. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with some spiritual blessings, with many spiritual blessings. No. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. It was intentional. God did it. He purposed it. You know, what was it, Peter or Stephen? I think it was Peter preaching to the people at, right after the crucifixion said, you men of Galilee who took Christ and crucified him, God has intended his death for a purpose. God had intended it. He had planned it. And that just blows my mind and blows your mind probably when you stop to think about it, that, the, that a loving father, heavenly father, would do that to his only begotten son. But you see, God has done that for you and for me. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's love. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, it says in the original King James, but God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, if you have in your translation, it will probably say that God demonstrated his love or God proved his love toward us. I like the word commendeth. I think it's a good word. It's, a, it's an old word. <clears throat> but you see what it means is that God supremely proved his love for us. God had showed us his love many, many times. But he supremely showed us his love when he gave us his son to die on a cross for you and for me. He supremely demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, now there's a key. Can you imagine Brother Park being out here with his grandkids some night around the campfire? And, uh, <laughs> campfire, not far. Campfire. <laughs> the East Texans coming out in me. And, and, and he says, hey, kids, gather around here. I, I want to show you all something. I want to show you how much I love you. And he just sticks his hand in the fire, and it just burns his hand real bad. You know, everybody would be saying, Park, what in the world were you thinking about? They'd be calling the guys in the white suits and say, let's have him examined. But if one of those grandchildren fell into the fire, then he'd reach into the fire and risk burning both hands to get the child out, and then he could say, that's how much I love you. Well, you see, we were sinners. We needed somebody to reach into the fire and pull us out. And Christ did it. But God supremely demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Look at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3. John says, behold. I can't do that like Sam does. Behold, you know. 
I, I won't even try that. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. Just stop right there. That phrase is an amazing phrase. We just read it and pass over it. But what it means is, behold, this love that God has bestowed upon us, it, 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 it came from another country, it came from another planet. You see, they weren't used to that type of love around the countries of the New Testament. Have you ever, I like to work with wood, and a woman might work with quilts, and all of a sudden one day she comes into a, the presence of a woman that's quilted this quilt that's just out of this world. And she says, wow, who did this? Where did this quilt come from? Like I said, I like to work with wood. When I resigned First Baptist Church of White House, there were 11 pieces of furniture in my study, and I had made 10 of them. I like working with wood and furniture. I like to go to the Amish furniture store in Dallas. Have you, any of you ever been? It used to be out at... Uh, at Forney out in there, but now it's moved to the north side of Dallas. And you're talking about quality. Oh, my lands. And you go into a place that's got a dining room suit, and it might be in a medium oak finish, but over here on the wall, they'll have about six panels of the different kinds of finishes and woods you can get that very same dining room suit in. It's exceptional quality. And when I'd go in there, I'd just say, wow, who made this, <laughs> you know? Oh, the Amish did. And uh, it, it's just exceptional. Well, what John is saying here is that when we look at the love of God, that he has made us to be his children, we just want to say, wow, where did this love come from? <clears throat> Literally, the phrase is, what country did it come from? And, and really, if you want to make it drive home today, it's like him saying, what planet did this come from? You, says he, you see, he says in verse 3, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And in your newer translations, there will be a phrase that says, which we are. And that's important because you see that phrase comes from some of the the better manuscripts that were discovered after the King James was written. I'm reading the New King James. And then you can come down in verse 2, and he says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. We are the children of God. What love. God has purposely loved us so much that he sent Christ to die for us. We didn't deserve it. It cost him the, the death of his son. And it's for the purpose of redemption, for drawing us into a right relationship with God. That's why it's so important that we walk with him every day. Amen? Because God has done so much for us here. So we've learned from a broken Old Testament marriage Oh, I went over. Sam would be proud of me. <laughs> oh, part of that was the business conference, though. So. I hope you'll take Hosea and that you'll read him. I hope you'll get one of these little booklets. And uh, what I suggest you to do is read one lesson a day, look up the scriptures, think about it, reflect on it, meditate upon it. And hopefully, God will use it to bless your heart and your life. Amen? I think Brother Park is going to dismiss us in a song. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's laying on the floor here. Would you stand? Let's have prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much. Dear God, we are amazed at how much you love us. Thank you for <clears throat> Hosea's life. Thank you, dear Father, for the fact that his life became an object lesson to Israel, <clears throat> but not just to Israel, to us also. Heavenly Father, go with us that we can live for you in a way that pleases you this coming week, the rest of this week. In Christ's name I pray.
Amen.